came, they dismantled it. They oh. sprayed the wood so it would last longer oh. and re brought it here and remounted it. And CERN uses it as a, uh, it's called the, the Globe of Innovation and they use it as an outreach uh, center. Here. Wow. Uh, it's quite nice. So there's meetings in there and yes. it's kind yeah. of a creative yeah. space. Yeah. I met Laurent uh, last year yeah. for Lyft because he wanted to know if he could hold his final party in there. Yeah. and I thought I thought he could and we contacted the CERN people yeah. and they just changed the guy oh. in charge of it and then he said oh no you have to pay oh. money. Oh, okay. Bye, thank you. Oh, Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> so let's go quickly. Let's go quickly and see the, the cube. So uh, you're going to show us uh, Tim Berners-Lee's cube? Right. And you were his mentor, right? I was one of his mentors, yeah. And you were the uh, Revolutionary who brought uh, TCP this is VIP and Unix into this place, yeah. yeah and yeah. Tell, tell us a little <laughs> bit about the uh, tell us a little bit about the early days. Um, why was there a resistance to Unix? You know, yeah, because well, TCP/IP because it was an American technology. Uh, it was going to rock the boat with the with the monopolies of the PDTs and the European industry, and because soon. Is a very conservative organization and was even more. And we weren't supposed to do development and we weren't supposed to experiment like that. We were supposed to use what was there. And what was there wouldn't connect, whoops, what was there wouldn't connect all the different sorts of computers we had. And so it was a five year struggle basically. And Tim was a young guy working in another group and he worked with us on advanced things like remote procedure call and TCP and so on in his spare time. And, uh, and he invented the world. And, uh, okay, so here, here, this corridor is some of the pictures of the, the beginning of CERN. These are pictures from, CERN was started in the 50s. So imagine that the countries that had been at war, wow. you know, start, the war had finished in 45 and CERN was, was founded in the 50s. Uh, and uh, we had the, you know, Germans, French, Italian, English, etc., all working together. Yeah, so these, this is the beginning. Our 50th anniversary was uh, a few years ago, three years ago. What was your job here when, when you? Because well, uh, I was, I was, you're retired now, right? I'm retired. I'm still honorary staff here. I still have an office and projects here. Um, my job. I was a networking person always here, and. Uh, uh, towards the end, uh, high-speed networking, really high-speed, gigabit networking, you know, seven or eight years ago. And um, I was a grid manager. Uh, I managed the data management part of the grid, of the first grid project here, um, the last thing I did here. Um, when did you start working here? 71. 71. Yeah, sorry. but I was already an old guy. I was 34 when I came here. And the head of IT at that time, he wouldn't interview me for a job. He said I was too old. <laughs> even back even then. Yeah, yeah, even back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I sort of snuck in. Yeah. What was the day like when uh, Tim first showed you the web? Oh, well, I remember it very clearly. Um, well, I remember him installing, installing his next machine and how it was so easy to install and he had all the stuff on it that we, you know, all the software that we had struggled to find, you know, it was all there, it was all working. And when he started to show us the stuff, very few people understood really what the potential, nobody really understood the potential, uh, his hypertext stuff, you know, but um, he had a very good manager who made space for him and there were a few people, yeah, like me and a few others who encouraged him. Um, that he needed, you know, he needed this. But it was a spare time project. He had his main line work, and uh, uh, he's a very nice guy too. Uh, so he didn't know that this would conquer the world. He just hoped he used to say, "Oh Ben, you know, if only people could agree on these few simple things." You know, I would say, "Tim, they'll never agree." <laughs> uh, so it was a miracle. It was a great, uh, a great time, and uh, it's a shame he had to leave. So, so what was it like when he showed it to you? What, what, what was that? Well, I mean... What uh, did he say to you? Did, hey, look at this, or... 
he, he, he had two or three next machines and he showed me the, he was, he was uh, looking at the files on the other, on the other machine and uh, with his browser. He had a, he developed the server, the client, the browser, um, everything. And uh, all running on TCP IP and so on. Uh, how can I say? I, I remember it very clearly. And uh, then he used to go around uh, physics conferences trying to, to sell this idea. One time there was a big crowd. I wasn't there, but there was a big crowd around something. And one of the directors of CERN went over, oh, the, what's going on here, you know? And so someone said, oh, this is Tim Berners-Lee. Look, this is, this is the World Wide Web. And the director had no idea, you know, what, what this was. And uh, yeah, uh, he was looking and, oh, this is from the computer department. And what is this? And he wasn't too pleased because the big physics conferences, you know, were supposed to be about physics. And why was the big crowd around this guy you'd never heard of doing something he didn't know what it was about? So it's not right to say it was developed uh, uh, for the physicist. It was developed here, and Tim tried to sell it, of course, as uh, an aid to the collaborations, which it was. But they didn't really adopt it quickly. Um, it was a, adopted in a few physics labs at Slack, by the way. Yeah. Um, that was the home of the first website in the United absolutely, States. Absolutely, right? yes. Um, there were a few, a few people like Tim, uh, you know, who, who could, could immediately get it um, and work on it, but they were marginal people. Um, they weren't in the main line. And um, um, it took several years before the idea went out. And the crucial thing was a development in the U.S. by the uh, NCSA in, in uh, Illinois uh, with uh, Andreessen, Mark Andreessen and his boss, who really got it. And they uh, developed Mosaic, which was a very sexy browser, more than Tim had. Well, Tim's was a very sexy browser, but it only ran on the, on the next. It, it, um, I forget, what, I forget if it had a name, because it wasn't. It didn't go out. The browser. Yeah, but but he didn't, probably didn't, wouldn't call it a browser. It was just a, a web component. It was the client. Um, but when when Mosaic came out and ran on PCs and you know everywhere, that made a huge difference. And Tim had wanted to develop on the PC, but he hadn't got the resources to do it here. So and then he left. He got the offer he couldn't refuse from MIT. MIT had made the X consortium. They knew how to make consortiums, mm -hmm. consortia, and they offered him. Uh, they made him a professor. Uh, he hadn't got a PhD. To him. He was the first professor at MIT ever without a PhD, as far as I know. Uh, the professorship was founded by 3Com, by the way. So he's the 3Com professor, <laughs> and they gave him this group, and they founded the World Wide Web Consortium, mm -hmm. of which a part was to be in Europe. And he wanted the European part to be at CERN. And there was even some money for it from the European Union, who had come over by this time to accept the internet, started to, because the web had been invented in Europe. And uh, the money was given away, given to INRIA, a French institute in Grenoble, to work on. So CERN at that time was absolutely sure that they didn't want to distract themselves working on the web. And they needed to get the money and the concentration for this LHC project, which you mm -hmm. see today, has come, come to fruit. Um, and CERN was always frightened for years that the member states would say to them, you've been working on computer science research, and if you have enough money to do that, then your budget's too big and we'll cut it. They were, they were always frightened of it. Uh, finally, when it did come out, uh, the member states were delighted. <laughs> Much to the surprise of everybody, and now CERN on the web page says, you know, where the web was born. And it was born here, but it wasn't ordered here. So that's the story. Let's go and see, yeah. let's go and see the machine. The, buying this machine, or actually we bought in two or three machines, was again illegal. The next wasn't, wasn't an approved, uh, wasn't an approved uh, equipment and had to be bought sort of underhand. His manager, who was uh, an Englishman called Mike Sandall, with a great sense of humor, and was senior enough that he could sort of shrug off doing, you know, under, under, underhand things. He, bought, he, he arranged to get the machine. Uh, two machines, yeah. maybe three. Um, so, this part of the microcosm is explaining the, you know, physics fundamentals, the sort of thing that Frank already explained to us. So we don't need to stop here. Uh, there is, ah, uh, this isn't working today. There is a nice cosmic ray visualizing thing here, but it seems to be switched off. And here you would see. Oh, yes. Okay. 
that's the cosmic ray coming down and being displayed by this uh, oh. uh, this um, uh, electronic wire chamber. Uh, it's not really working as well as it did when when I was here last year. Oh, no, last so year with, with Robert. Robert. Yes, yes, these are actual cosmic rays in real time. I'm making. Sometimes you'll see a whole shower, the whole thing will light up. Wow. Yeah. No, okay. It's behaving. Itself. So this is what is going to happen inside the detectors you've seen on, you know, billions and billions times scale. Um, okay, so yeah, we, you, you can hear it. That's got to hurt. <laughs> yes. I can feel every one of those. Uh, these are models. That's the model of the last generation detector, where again, the human being it's the same looking thing as we've seen, but it's uh, quite a bit, bit smaller. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a one-tenth scale, so you can imagine it's big, but it's not as big as what we've seen. And here are some pictures of it. In, oh, there were, again, there were four of these detectors in the old system, in the old machine. L3, Aleph, Opal, and um, what was the last one called? Um, Opal. Yeah. And uh, so this machine, uh, it was in the same tunnel, it was an electron anti electron machine, and that gave beautiful results, but it didn't find anything new. It just confirmed the current theory. And at the very end, I was saying to, to, uh, <coughs> to Libby as we came across, at the very end, the last few months of operation, they thought they'd seen the Higgs in this machine. And they pleaded with the director general to go on, let, give them more time. And in the end, the director general had to stop the accelerator so they could start to build a new one because it, it involved dismantling the old one. And uh, he, he, he called it, and he was right. Uh, in retrospect, he was right. So they hadn't actually seen the Higgs, but they thought they might. You were at that meeting? Yes, I was at the meeting where it was where contentious. It was very contentious. The physicists were almost in tears. Oh, please, you know, we, we, we've got a signal. and. Uh, and when um, was that? That was, let me see. Ooh. Um, probably about 2000. Probably 99 or 2000, something like that. Yeah. So yeah. it took it was eight years, eight or to, nine to, years to get yeah. to where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, this stuff has been designed for 15 years. These detectors and so on, these are 15 year projects. So, okay, we'll just uh, you know, see the cube. Here it is. This is. This is where it happened. That was the next cube. Wow. That's the next cube. Yeah. So this is Tim's actual machine. This actual he had two of them. Or may, he probably had three, but he worked on two. And uh, his writing is still there. This machine is a server, do not power it down. <laughs> <laughs> because it just looked like a desktop machine. That is, a desktop machine could be a server, was you know, interesting. The book here, the book, I think that's in fire. I believe that's a copy of a, a sort of encyclopedia that Tim was given when he was a kid or a young man called Inquire Within about everything. It was a sort of encyclopedia. And Tim was very, very fired up by this. And he had the dream that all information you know, could be uh, sorted in such a way that you could quickly inquire within it. But, and he knew about hypertext, which, was, uh, which had been uh, invented before, and which was implemented, by the way, on the Macintosh at that time, but always in the same machine. So you could, the idea of links and clicking and, 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 and getting new pages was, was not new. His breakthrough was that this should be able to go across machines and across networks and across the world. And that on the operating systems, which were all different in those days, and the, and the computer hardware, that you could have a, unifying, a uniforming, uniformizing layer so that 
even though this this data was all in different formats and so on, you could you could view it uniformly. And that was and that was when he would say, you know, if people could just agree on these few little things, we could do this. And I would say, they'll never agree. They don't want to agree. Um, and they didn't want to agree, but in the end, they did want to agree <laughs> because it wasn't. Anything. This is a copy of one of the later, his first report, probably his second report, 89, where he was making a proposal to certain, man certain management to let him work on this hypertext network, hypertext idea. And he dressed it up as, you know, uh, he integrated it into the, the mission of the lab, uh, the collaboration and so on. It was a good selling paper, but it wasn't so easy to read, as you see his picture for the remnants of him. Tim is a visionary. He's not a perfect expositor. A lot of people are disappointed when they see him speak because uh, he sees a lot in his head and he can speak too quickly. And I mean, it's nothing like what you saw yesterday when Francois Gray gave that beautiful talk, I thought, one of the last talks yesterday afternoon. Uh, and Francois is a born uh, expositor. But Tim uh, can see all this, but he's not necessarily easy to understand when he talks. Yeah. Um, he talks in run-on sentences. Yes. He's, he's very hard to quote. <laughs> because right. Of that. right. I remember uh, sitting through a presentation and thinking, wow, how am I going to get a blog test out of this? <laughs> okay, right. But Tim is a very great guy. He's very modest. He's very normal. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, and he's not been spoiled by this at all.